and in two minutes, these doors are going to be closed. And from there, there is no escape. So the mic is now on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here today. Uh, this session is, has now officially started. My name is Colin Heron. I'm the Senior Water Resources Management Specialist at the Global Water Partnership, based here in Stockholm. So in that capacity, it's my pleasure to welcome you all and greet you here in Stockholm, um, and also for this very interesting session that I think will be really uh, one of the highlights of the week. Um, how can we activate the innovation accelerator of SDG 6? Uh, we, there are five accelerators, we'll hear more about them today, but uh, we are here to really unpack what the secret source is. So I will promise to keep everything on track. We have a very packed agenda because we've really scoured the surface of so many examples of great innovation uh, who will be presenting to you today. Um, I would like to kick us off. Uh, this session is being co-convened by the Global Water Partnership and UN Water. We had a very interesting debate in the last two days within UN Water on innovation, among other topics. So representing both UN Water and UNEP, I'd like to invite uh, my good friend Joachim Harlin up to stage to uh, look back a little bit on what has happened over the last uh, few months uh, regarding SDG 6, where we are, and to set the scene for today's session. And Joachim, you will have eight minutes. And for all speakers, including myself, when you're getting close to time, yes, when you're on time and I'm going to turn off the microphone, red card. Okay, so Joachim, over to you. Okay. What about the time? Ah, exactly. Thank you, Joachim, for <laughs> reminding me. So what I'm going to do when I introduce each and every one of the speakers is I'm going to give you a fun fact about them, something that you probably didn't know, even if you know the speakers very well. So Joachim invented the dust magnet when he was educating his growing children on how companies are born and operate. It's a pretty high bar to reach. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So if we can... If where we do can, you want me to stand? If you can stand wherever you, where you please, yeah. yes. <laughs> and if the uh, presentation could be put on screen, please. Um, oh, oh, oh. And you have the pointer. Thank you. So the dust magnet doesn't actually exist, right? But if it did, I would buy one straight away. <laughs> I'll tell you about it later. But it's an innovation of scale. Is this it? All right. So I was told to speak a little bit about why we're doing this. 
and set the scene. And um, so I started to think about why and, and the sense of urgency, right? So we've just had the SDG 6 synthesis report. We've had the conference in March. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing that we need to increase the pace sixfold in, in drinking water, fivefold on sanitation, double the pace on water resources management. I mean, look, we're halfway into Agenda 2030, and, and, and this is what we need to do, accelerate, right? And how can we do that? Well, we have to look at what's happening also around us. Everybody has seen and knows about climate change and all this impact it's having. This is accelerating too, right? And, and, and this is interesting to see that, you know, the extremes that are coming are also coming in the places where the, the temperature on average is rising. So that's something to think about. And, and look at the world population. You know that there are more people alive today than have ever died. So that's actually a fact. And this is going up and up and up. And what are these people doing? They're consuming more and more energy. And what more are they doing? They're eating more and more, and they're consuming more of everything, actually. But this is just the food needs coming forward. And what is the response to this? We need collective action. We've talked about that already at this Water Week. And um, so what the UN Water did was to develop what we call the Global Acceleration Framework. And uh, this was launched in 2020. Uh, as part of the Secretary General's decade action to deliver on SDG 6 by, or the whole SDG by 2030, but we're looking here specifically at SDG 6, of course. And um, it's very much linked to the new water action agenda, underpins it. So that framework then has five different dimensions, finance, data information, capacity development, governance, and innovation. So that's why we're here. We're going to talk about innovation linked to these topics. And uh, I think we need to innovate across the board. And, and we need to think about technologies. Okay, let's think about technologies for a little moment. How many people here know about Google Bard? About a third, I would say. Interesting. If I ask this question a, a year from now, I think everybody would just say, stop. This is like ridiculous. We've been using this a lot now. AI technologies are, are going to penetrate the whole society, I think. It's going to be lots of stuff there. But look, that's just an example of a technology, right? But we need to innovate in many other fields, like in the policy field, in the management practice field, in governance, institutions, and much more. And that's what I'm trying to set the scene for that discussion. <laughs> so we need this innovation to happen. But we also need to bring innovation that is already exists and bring it to scale, make it impactful, make it relevant. And, and that's how I want to just end this. I don't want to steal the thunder from anyone else. So over to you now, Colin. Thank you so much, Joachim. Um, we have prepared an interactive um, element for all of the audience, both here and online. Let's see if this works. Uh, we're very much experimenting with this session. And uh, like all experimentations and all innovation, we have to accept that there are risks. Failure is one of those risks. Let's see if we fail or not. Um, in theory, OK, I see something on the map. This is great. If you go to um, pollev.com slash GWP, um, you should, in theory, see a map where you can uh, just click on to indicate where you live, where is home for you, not necessarily where you were born. This is just to get a feeling for the audience, both here and online. And I'm very pleased to see that this is working. Some innovations do, uh, do prosper and help. OK, we have a pretty broad spread. And interestingly, the technology is on our side. So innovation can include appropriate technology, but there's a social aspect to this. It needs people to click on the technology. OK. Um, now we have the second side of innovation, which is failure. So 
this was going to ask a, a very important question to set the scene for the session. Uh, that question was, what do you think are the main obstacles to innovation in the context of SDG 6? Now, because we don't have technology, but we have collective brilliance here, I'm just going to ask people to shout out uh, the, the first word that comes to their mind when you think of obstacles, what's holding us back? And I will repeat these because uh, we want to capture them for posterity. So anyone, please shout out. In fact, even better, let's all do it on count of five. One word that comes to your mind. So I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five. Interesting. Yeah, no, I didn't catch most of that, but <laughs> as a social experiment, it, it sounded cool. Um, anyway, uh, so this was just to sort of uh, break the ice, if it's not already broken, and to set the scene a little bit. Um, but now, when we talk about innovation and especially public sector governance, management, um, of course, w one of the best examples that comes to at least my mind is, is Singapore which is a, an in extraordinary example of how uh, the public and private sectors can come together under a strong unified vision. So we were, we're very pleased to have Bernard Coe here today, who is the um, assistant, um, I'm sorry, uh, the assistant chief executive of um, PUB Singapore. Fun fact about Bernard is that he bakes cheesecakes and chocolate cakes in his free time and for birthdays. So now you know Bernard a little bit more. Um, Bernard, I will pass over to you. You have six minutes, please. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be here and uh, nice to meet all of you. Um, let me allow me to share a bit of. Um, oops. Okay. Shouldn't I have done that. Um, <laughs> okay. Can someone assist? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay. You're back. All right, yeah, technology works there. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so how is uh, SDG um, 6 uh, as, uh, accelerator, acceleration um, accelerators uh, is, uh, helped Singapore in, in the past in our journey of innovation? Uh, let me just give a bit of a background. Um, Singapore became independent in 1965. Uh, we had polluted waterways uh, because of illegal um, discharges due to lack of uh, enforcement and the absence of uh, proper sewage facilities. So uh, we also encountered floods whenever it rained heavily um, due to inadequate drainage capacity. This is especially so in low-lying areas. And Singapore also had poor sanitation in the past. Uh, sewage infrastructure was inadequate and many communities were served by manual night soil collection. After 60 years, Singapore has uh, transformed itself into an attractive livable city um, with clean waterways and reservoirs with 100% access to safe drinking water and sanitation. The transformation journey uh, did not come easy. Uh, allow me to share a few examples of how Singapore has managed to achieve uh, progress on this SDG 6. Technology and innovation uh, have been really at the heart of uh, Singapore's uh, water story. Uh, over the years, we have invested in R&D and uh, leveraged uh, technology to overcome our water challenges, uh, and we will continue to do so. PUB works with uh, researchers and uh, industrial players from all over the world. We open up our facilities uh, for these solutions to be test beta. Um, no one has the monopoly of all the good ideas, uh, so through the Global Innovation Fund, uh, we seek out solutions globally and even in non-water sectors. Water reuse uh, and seawater desalination are examples of uh, how Singapore has overcome our water challenges with innovation. Uh, in 2003, we started uh, treating treated effluent water into high-grade reclaimed water called new water. And new water is Singapore's answer to SDG 6. By collecting and treating every drop of used water we are able to reuse the same drop of water endlessly. To be less dependent of, on water, on weather, we started to desalinate seawater in 2005. Both new water and desalinated water are climate resilient resources of water. They are an important source in helping us remain resilient against prolonged droughts. Water is a national priority. 
and high on the political agenda. Water is an existential issue and the government places a lot of emphasis on water management to ensure Singaporeans do not go thirsty and that the country's economic development are not impeded. In Singapore, only one agency, this uh, PUB, manages the entire water cycle, as you can see on the <coughs> left-hand side of the slide. This enhances operational efficiency and decision-making, facilitates optimal long-term planning of infrastructures and capabilities at the system level to ensure an adequate and sustainable water supply for water. We review our water master plan regularly and work closely with partner government agencies. We also have set in place legal and institutional frameworks uh, for water supply, pollution control in sewage and drainage, so as to safeguard our water sources and to maintain public health. To continue writing our water story, we have to start engaging and building the capacity and skill sets of our young, of our youth, and the next generation of water leaders. We educate our young on the importance of water conservation through school programs. We also started a leadership program for next generation global water le utilities leaders, offering valuable learning, networking, and exposure opportunities uh, with global industry and utility leaders during the Singapore International Water Week. We conduct training programs for fellow uh, developing countries through the Singapore Cooperation Program to impart the knowledge and skills that PUB has learned from our experiences. We embark on the digital transformation to become a smart PUB in 2018. We have implemented digital initiative across our operations to increase data collections and allow us to make sense of the data to improve planning and operations. For example, data from smart meters and sensors can be used to actively monitor water usage and detect leaks, reducing the loss of precious water. No country can tackle its future challenges alone. So Singapore has benefited from being able to learn from experiences of government and industry partners from all over the world. We want to continue to do so. Singapore shares our knowledge and experience through platforms such as the Singapore International Water Week uh, with government officials, business leaders, academics, and all over the world to come together to exchange ideas on water policies and technologies. With half of the world's largest cities experiencing water scarcity, we hope Singapore's experience can be of relevance. Key factors and drivers that may be replicated include nurturing an innovative ecosystem that is open to the world, collaborating with partners and researchers globally, with commitment at the highest level of government. All policies must take into account the water security. Adopt a long-term view in planning. Water is priced to reflect its scarcity value, allowing water utilities to recover costs while water remains affordable. Continuous effort in public education and engagement, implementation of smart tech solutions to achieve operational excellence. So on that note, I thank you for your kind attention. Okay, that was perfectly on time as well, uh, which is always nice. Uh, thank you very much for that very uh, interesting presentation. And I also want to point to the fact that um, Every year now, UN Water is producing three country case studies on how countries are accelerating progress towards SDG 6. And this year, one of them is, is on Singapore, so we will make that. Uh, it's actually at the back there. If you want a copy, then you have to mug class for it. Um, but um, yeah, th this is uh, very much highlighting what some countries are doing well uh, and what are the learnings from these uh, country case studies. Now, we are going to switch tone. Um, I have four interesting um, stories that will be shared by four amazing individuals who I will introduce by their fun facts um, to get them on, up on stage. Um, so in no particular order, we have uh, Dave Duncan, or David Duncan, who is leading the UNICEF Office of Innovation as a senior advisor. Uh, the fun fact about Dave is that for about 10 years, the French government recognized that he was married to his wife, but not that she was married to him. 
that is an interesting one. I think if you want to know more about that, you have to invite Dave out for a beer afterwards. So, or two. Um, so, um, Dave, if you could come up, please. And while I'm also inviting the second speaker as well, um, I'll have all four of you up on stage. So, Gustavo Saltiel from the World Bank is a global lead for water supply and sanitation. Uh, the fun fact about Gustavo is that he and I worked together in the Conagua in Mexico uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, we're not going to say how many, but we had lots of fun there. So, thank you, Gustavo. Um, Third is Cheryl Hicks from the uh, Water Resilience Coalition and uh, Wash for Work initiatives. Um, and her position is a senior advisor to the, senior, uh, to the CEO water mandate. The fun fact about Cheryl is that she made the conscious decision to put her career in the toilet. And she's often been referred to as the toilet lady for her role in launching the Toilet Board Coalition, supporting sanitation entrepreneurs and innovations. And the fourth speaker uh, is Abu Amani from UNESCO. He is the director of the Division of Water Sciences and the secretary of the International Hydrological Program, IHP. The fun fact about Abu is that 50 years ago, believe it or not, uh, he used to fetch water before going to school. Okay, so the four speakers we have, I'll, I'll ask each of you to tell a story in five minutes around innovation. Um, starting in the order that I introduce you, so Dave, if you could please go first. I'll be taking the five minutes. Uh, any mic that you'd like. I'll choose the middle one. Nobody told me I could bring notes. <laughs> <laughs> it's an innovation. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks very much for the introduction, Colin. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm briefly just going to talk a little bit about a, a UNICEF um, initiative in West Africa, the Sanitation Revolving Fund. Um, and I'm actually going to focus on, whilst that takes place in Ghana, Togo and Nigeria, I'll focus on Ghana because I've got some personal experience with that. The, the story kind of started about six years ago. Uh, I won't go back six billion when it really started, or 13. Anyway, it started about six years ago when UNICEF started looking at urban sanitation a little bit closer. And we realised that whilst there was a large part proportion of the urban population who were using public toilets, most of them couldn't actually afford to buy a, a, a household toilet. And they got locked into this vicious cycle where if they could actually take what they were paying for the public toilet, within a year or two, they could actually pay for a private a household toilet. They just weren't able to do that. And we started exploring a little bit further. And what we realised was that the underlying key problem was that the cost of interest rates from microfinance was about 50 to 70%. And it just made it impossible for families to actually get ahead of the curve. And if you can pay 70%, you can pretty well pay for the whole thing up front anyway. So we started looking at reducing costs by different designs, using working materials. We started increasing competition. We started looking at training up um, private sector players. But all we really did was took the edges off the problem. So we, we got involved. We brought in the stakeholders, the, the beneficiaries. We brought in government. We had discussions with the financial um, institutions, with financial NGOs. And at the end of the day, the realisation was, yeah, bluntly, we just need cheaper loans to be able to afford sanitation. It's the only way we're going to get the capital up front in a way that could do it. So we then started doing what everybody does. We looked all around the world. We looked in the region. We tried different approaches. We came up across microfinance approaches. We came across government-based approaches. The microfinance challenge was that the organisations their overheads were so high, they were being absorbed in that 70%. But that was never going to be manageable. They weren't going to be able to bring it low enough. The government-based approach in Ghana, there's a high likelihood people, if they knew the funding was coming from government, would not repay it. And kind of loans don't work very well if people don't repay them, so we had to look for other solutions. So we, we carried on with the discussions and eventually refined it down to an approach which actually involved the banks, which was quite a new one for UNICEF. And the approach was two-tiered. UNICEF was actually going to loan money to the Apex Bank, which is a quasi-government regulatory bank, at 0%. So they had no capital risk. And suddenly, interest rates could get a lot more interesting. Um, and they would then on-lend that to rural banks who had, had the broad network of reach and would, they would loan it on to households at about 12%. And 
massively down from the 50 to 70 percent. Um, and the idea with that 12 percent is that would cover bad debt, it would cover overheads, operational costs, and a bit of profit. So anyway, we started going down this pathway and then realised actually getting this approved within UNICEF was one of our biggest challenges. The UN is not set up to take loans. The UN is not set up to work with banks as a private partner, with the possible exception of a few financial arms of the, the UN. So we had to go through a very long internal process ask, answering reasonable questions like, why is UNICEF charging interest to beneficiaries? Um, and are we selling poor families into debt that they can't manage? So working through that process within UNICEF took about a year. Um, that was about six years ago. The organisations have evolved a considerable amount since then. But I think it was a learning experience that trying to get organisations, UN organisations in particular, through major changes, take time. There was a silver lining to that one year process. It meant that we were able to line up our uh, demand process, uh, generation process, get our suppliers all ready to go. So when we were able to finally launch the scheme, we got rapid uptake. Within weeks, we got 40% of the funding that we had available, um, thanks to the Dutch government, um, who I throw out a particular thanks to. It was partly their support that helped us get that whole process through the, the challenging times. Um, we started with about half a million dollars, and 30, 40% of that was gone within weeks. The rest got taken up very, very rapidly, um, to the point where the banks stopped just to review things because the money was being absorbed quicker than we anticipated. Um, in, in general, there were some hiccups, but the process worked and worked well. Fast forwarding now, five, six years later, we're at a point where we've got thousands of houses which have toilets. The scheme of, in various guises are being looked at across multiple countries. We're now at a point where there's enough data um, and sufficient quality data to give financial institutions confidence that this might actually scale as an independent financial imp implement, which means that with the, things like, with the use of things like impact bonds as blended funding, we might actually be able to set up, a, and we are talking about investment of tens of millions of dollars here, um, and actually be able to generate massive numbers of toilets very, very rapidly across the whole region. We're not there yet, but there's some big movements. Um, so three key lessons we got from this. The first is institutional change is difficult, but it really can be worth it. Second, your partners are gold. Embrace them really strongly when you're going through innovation. Um, and the third lesson from all of this was that um, when you're actually implementing, you really need to be learning and moving forward and changing on your feet. Um, that happened the whole way through the process. And thanks very much. Thanks so much, Dave. I, I have to say that there are many nuggets of gold there, and, and innovation is not always easy, I think is one of the uh, lessons here. I mean, we may come up with the best idea in the world, but getting it, getting it, getting traction within our institutions is not always easy. Um, so, uh, next to tell a story, I'd like to invite Gustavo up uh, for his five minutes uh, of storytelling. Imagine that we're all around the campfire here and we're roasting uh, marshmallows. Gustavo, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, and thanks the conveners and partners for inviting us to speak at this session. So, as everybody knows, a lot of things are happening as we speak on innovation. And I would say the most popular or well-known innovations are around digital technologies, artificial intelligence, sensors, water quality moni monitoring, you name it. A lot of things are happening and happening very rapidly to the point that, in our view, at the World Bank, this is changing the way we, the multilateral organizations, are doing business in the water sector. But I would like to talk about a different type of innovation, which is on lending instruments, which is the main tool that we use to engage with our clients, the countries. 
uh, about eight years ago, the World Bank developed a very innovative instrument for lending that we call the program for results. And there had been in the development community previous iterations of this instrument, financing based on results, based on outputs. But this is the first one, uh, and it's a dramatic change in the, um, I would say, in the, in the modalities of the multilateral organizations, because we provide resources and loans against achievement of certain KPIs or targets or results. So I would like to give an example of a program for results in one particular country for rural sanitation in Egypt, uh, because I think it's already, I mean, the program was approved seven years ago by the World Bank, but also by the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, so it's co-financed is more than $1 billion that is dispersing against specific indicators, such as, for instance, obviously access or number of connections or number of people connected, that's a very easy one, but also against performance improvement of utilities, measured as uh, improvement in uh, energy efficiency or water use efficiency, improvement in water quality, improvement in the procurement modalities of utilities, all those KPIs uh, generate disbursements by the World Bank. Uh, so this is very innovative but because it's moving away from uh, our traditional approach to disburse or to finance based on statement of expenditures. You know, bills or whatever countries submit to the bank, we pay against. Now we are paying against results. So let me share some lessons learned from this program in Egypt. So I said it's a $1 billion program, uh, includes ensuring a focus on the development objectives and results, which the government, not the World Bank, intends to achieve, in this case, sustainable rural sanitation services as opposed to infrastructure, so that's one. Second, very important for this type of instrument, using the country's systems, not the World Bank standards in terms of fiduciary standards or safeguards, environmental and social, but using country systems that we help to improve and, and systems that the country wants to adopt at scale not requiring a parallel set of technical fiduciary and safeguard instruments. Third, leveraging government of Egypt in this case, but for any other countries and development partners financing to support a program that has been scaled up nationally. Four, supporting a move towards or a focus on service delivery and service providers capacity and autonomy away from an exclusive focus on centralized construction of infrastructure. What we did in the past was financing infrastructure, developed or designed, planned, designed and built by the national government. Now it's uh, the utilities, the subnational utilities. Five, pro-poor interventions through related investments. For example, appropriate technologies in remote villages. That's another innovation. Six, strengthening accountability and transparency as well as government systems for monitoring evaluation through the introduction of independent verification protocols, which is critical because you are dispersing against results. How do we know that the results have actually been achieved? So there is a system of independent certifiers that certifies that the results have been achieved. Um, I would. I know I don't have time calling, but I'd like to mention two more. One is, I would say, a path-breaking system of fiscal transfers. So here you have a national government. The World Bank disburses to the national government, but the national government needs to disburse to the subnational utilities. And that is done based on performance achieved by the utilities. The national government disburses against those. And finally, the participation of the communities and CSOs and also the private sector that is also reward, rewarded through specific disbursements against part community participation mechanisms. Let's, let me stop here. Thank you very much.
Obviously, the, the uh, potential for replication in multilateral financial institutions is high if they're willing to take the risk, which is one of the elements that's necessary to implement uh, innovation. Thanks so much. Uh, next would be Cheryl. Uh, your five minutes start now. Great. Am I audible on this mic? Yes. Great. Great. Well, thank you, first of all, for the opportunity um, to, to speak here in this important conversation, not only about innovations um, for advancing our water goals, but how innovation happens. Um, I think it's a, it's a really innovative uh, session, so thank you, Colin. Um, and I'm going to speak about um, innovating corporate water stewardship, um, how companies are working together in new ways um, to compound impact for water resilience. And related to um, the SDG accelerators, um, I'm going to cover um, innovations in private sector action on water resilience in the following areas. Um, collective action at basin level to achieve positive water impact in 100 water stress basins by 2030. Corporate co-investments in water via the capital markets to increase private sector investments in water. Leveraging business ex expertise and innovation um, to bring best in class and scalable uh, approaches to water resilience. And digitizing impact measurement and monitoring to support the ecosystem of data capture and analytics um, for water. I'll just focus in on, on two of those, but the story behind that um, is that in 2020, um, the CEO-led group um, of companies from within the CEO water mandate launched the Water Resilience Coalition. Um, and this was launched to, to really elevate um, corporate ambitions on water um, to achieve net positive water impact in their own operations by 2050. And as I said, to work together in basins at basin level to achieve positive water impact in 100 of the most water stressed basins. And the genesis of this initiative was really the recognition um, that we're way behind um, on our water goals. And we needed to really um, work differently, not only bilaterally, as companies had been doing in the past, but really uh, work much more collaboratively um, in order to reach our goals. And there was a recognition that um, business had a unique role to play, and their uniqueness uh, was not always leveraged um, for, for water. Um, and secondly, that action needs to be coordinated to have impact at scale. Um, and so the recognition that, you know, companies, um, even the most pioneering leaders, um, have been uh, working on water uh, for a long time cannot achieve the goals that we need to achieve without working together. So that was really the, the genesis of, of the initiative. And <clears throat> innovative um, solutions uh, were not only in what you would expect um, from companies around, uh, around efficiency um, and, uh, and leveraging new technologies, as we heard about before, um, but also innovations in how they were investing. And I'm going to talk about that specifically. Um, and also, um, companies are leaders of the digital transformation, and yet we're still not leveraging all of that expertise um, for water. So innovation number one um, is uh, uh, corporate collaborative and targeted investments um, via the capital markets. Um, so most companies um, that are not in the water sector, so the CEO water mandate is, is companies from uh, across sectors, um, uh, had been investing in water through philanthropy. And I think we all know that philanthropy and public finance alone is not enough to get us to our goals, and there's an increased need um, for increased private sector um, investment. Um, and so the companies uh, under this initiative uh, agreed to a collaborative, a collaborative investment strategy. A portfolio approach um, where they would seek to identify um, capital market mechanisms that they could invest in together um, to really um, uh, catapult uh, what their investments could do via philanthropy. And what we found um, is that companies got really interested in this strategy and from different parts of the company, the CFOs and the Treasury were all of a sudden involved in these, in these decisions because not only was this capital going to work for water and the goals that the companies had, um, but also this capital is returnable um, and not only returnable, but also returnable with an additional um, return. So that, that got um, quite interesting. And a demonstration um, of this strategy, um, we're really pleased to, uh, to have announced at the UN Water Conference in, in March the, the first fund uh, that companies have collectively invested in. It's in microfinance um, in, for water and sanitation. Uh, companies realize that they're really lagging behind uh, in the goals on water and sanitation, as we saw in the slides uh, earlier, and wanted to focus their first investment there. And so uh, they collectively invested um, just five companies um, uh, and partners uh, 
140 million uh, just in this one microfinance fund. And I'm pleased to say that we have a pipeline um, of investment opportunities that companies are exploring um, that uh, reach in the billions. Um, and they cover uh, areas such as nature-based solutions, um, reuse uh, infrastructure, um, and um, also development impact bonds, as we, as we talked about before. So uh, we think it's a really exciting first step um, for companies to invest this way together via the capital markets, um, investing much more, um, contributing to increasing private sector investments in water. And as the yellow card went up, I'll just go quickly into the second example, which is around this point of digital transformation and the unique role, you know, unique expertise that companies um, really have there. Um, and in, in 2021, um, we established a partnership with the European Space Agency um, to, uh, to identify um, you know, companies and, and leaders in, um, in digitizing uh, water, water uh, diagnostics and, and, uh, and monitoring. And, and this is really around the vision of imagining digital twins of, of water basins. We don't have this, and we could have this. We have the technology for this. We have digital twins of many other things. Um, but this group of companies, um, and we do have many technology players in the group, um, felt that this is an area that they could lean in and really help to create an open source platform um, to digitally um, monitor and create the diagnostics for basins to um, enable faster and more efficient decision making, but also to identify those targeted areas where um, companies uh, can invest together. Um, so in conclusion, um, what is new and innovative and scalable from the private sector? Companies going beyond uh, corporate operations to collective basin level action, targeted collective corporate um, investments via the capital markets, and mobilizing the expertise and innovation power of business for water, such as their expertise in digitization, leveraging the added value of better data. Thank you. I have to say, um, when I hear these presentations, I really think that we've, you know, it always sounds like the solution is so easy. Um, and why, don't, why aren't we just doing this at greater scale? Uh, capacity is one of the challenges. And I think we've mentioned, and Joachim mentioned the, the accelerators of SDG 6, uh, we ha and we've heard data, we've heard governance, we've heard financing, um, of course, innovation. And capacity development is another one of, of the accelerators. And, and Abu, in particular, uh, with UNESCO's role on the education, science, and culture, uh, I'd love to hear your five-minute, please, um, story to the crowd. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Colin. And uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, uh, to share with you some, uh, some ideas on uh, the role of innovation when it's come to the issue of uh, uh, capacity development. Uh, of course, I would have, uh, I could have you used to select some uh, innovation related to technology because, as you know, uh, we have been uh, using technology for our work in the hydrological cycle and understanding the hydrological cycle for casting early warming uh, systems, uh, monitoring water quality uh, in various areas in the world. But I prefer to present uh, the UN Water Capacity Development Initiative that's really an innovative example of uh, how all UN systems come together in order to accompany countries to build their capacity when it comes to the issue of capacity development. Because we believe that the way it was crafted, the way we will be operating it, is also innovative. So it's not only the issue of technological innovation, but the issue also of management processes is something which is extremely important. So the CDI, so the Capacity Development Initiative, uh, was crafted really to see, uh, as I said, how collectively UN uh, agencies and partners can join forces in accompanying in the ground, on the ground a country to fill the gap of capacity development. So this initiative uh, is a support of one of the five accelerators of uh, the Global Acceleration Framework of SDG 6. And I believe that this is also an opportunity to, see, to do the link with the other four accelerators. So what, what, what is the innovation within the methodological approach? The first innovation is that it's demand driven. This is very, very important. We cannot intervene 
collectively in a country if we don't have the highest level commitment to implement and to fill the gap. So this is one of the key elements we are considering when we are selecting countries. The second element of innovation is on the ownership. Because countries should own the development of the, in, of the, of the capacity of home plan and its implementation. And this is very important because we realize that in many uh, capacity development interventions, which are sometimes piecemeal interventions, uh, we cannot afford doing business as usual. So that ownership coming together is extremely important. The other element of innovation is a iterative learning process. This is very, very important because you know that uh, putting in place a plan uh, will need, of course, to identify what are the gaps, and then when it comes to the implementation, we should learn throughout the process uh, of uh, the implementation. The, the other element of the innovation there is we want from the beginning of the process to have potential donors part of the process so that at the end of the day, uh, when they, depending on the request of the member state, if they want to have a capacity development plan put in place, to have already donors interested to implement the plan. Because, you know, we used to have many policies, strategies, action plan, which are not implemented. We don't want that. What we want is that at the beginning of the process, so that we ensure that the plan which will be prepared will have funding to implement the plan. So those are the key elements I want to highlight, and I believe that this is something which we can use and replicate maybe within some of those four pillars, and probably uh, for the pillars of innovation, but this is an innovation which is going beyond technology. Of course, uh, we have also some innovation related to uh, doing the core business of education itself, because the way we are channeling the knowledge is also, we can have innovation uh, in that. We have all the issue of citizen science, we can, uh, we can harness all the issue of community gathering. So we have all those also approaches we can, we can use in order really to deliver the message. So that's what I can say. Of course, so far we don't have a lesson learned from the CDI, but we are lucky that we have two countries who are interested. We'll start soon ruling out the methodology in Panama and Costa Rica. Thank you. So far, I haven't had to make use of the red card, so thank you to all of our speakers for very instructive um, cases, examples, stories. Um, I will ask our speakers a couple of questions, um, and um, we're also taking questions from the online audience, and all of you here as well, if you do have a question, uh, get ready, because I will give you an opportunity to ask it. Um, I'll ask our four panelists the same two questions, and I'll be very quick fire, um, asking all of them to answer as, uh, as mm, quickly as they can, but getting into the requisite depth. First question is, okay, we, we've heard great examples, but we've also heard from Joachim that we're not reaching the global goals that we need to be reaching. In fact, we're falling further behind. How can we increase impactful innovation in water? Easy one to ask, very difficult one to answer. Uh, I'll, I'd like to go in the same order as the speaker spoke first. So first, uh, Dave, please. And you can take the mic uh, here if you like. Thanks. A um, couple of things, I think. Firstly, we need to be looking for step changes. Well, I've heard talk about acceleration and I've heard bending the curve and everything else. In reality, if we keep bending that curve, we're not going to hit 2030. Realistically, we're unlikely to hit 2040 we need to be looking for step change. And that means we need to be changing the whole paradigm that we're working with. 
innovative finance is one example of something that might give us an opportunity to do that. Um, just quickly, in, in WASH in particular, in water and sanitation, the vast majority of the funding, 61%, doesn't come from governments, doesn't come from ODA, doesn't come from donors, it comes from households in the, the countries that we're working in. So it's a matter of working out how do we u access that to use it in a better way. As I mentioned, innovative finance is one. Working differently with the private sector has got to be in there as well. So for me, they're the, the two key things that I think we really need to do. Paradigm shifts um, and less buzzwords as well. Um, so, no, no, that's brilliant. Um, I'm being facetious. Um, so, Gustavo, uh, same question. Uh, what do we need to do to increase our impactful innovations? Okay. Thank you, Colin. So, basically, I would say that, I mean, it's a kind of an oxymoron, but we need stronger champions from, you know, all across the, uh, the different stakeholders and players in the sector, elected officers, policy makers, local water authorities, uh, political leadership and political will in government is critical for increasing the reach of innovation. But also I'd like to focus on what we, the donors and the multilateral development banks can do, because as I said before, we must innovate as well. In the World Bank, we see key areas of focus to promote innovation moving forward. So one is donors or banks as brokers. We have the ability to link innovators, private sector, civil society and government through our interventions, be it financial or technical assistance. So donors as brokers promoting innovations. Second, innovations in procurement methods. Our procurement methods have been very rigid. So now, for instance, in the World Bank, we are exploring procurement innovations that focus on what we want to achieve, not on the technical specifications only. So it's a change in the way we will do procurement in the future, which will com contribute to bring in, bringing innovation, innovators and startups to the picture. Today it's very, it's very difficult to bring them for, for uh, multilaterals. Third, of course, support learning across sectors. Many innovations are happening in other sectors, like energy, telecoms, telecommunications, etc. And fourth, and uh, Cheryl talked about this, uh, innovations in terms of private intervention, private participation. And I can give another example of financing that we are providing, and this is kind of a pilot, to the local private providers of water in the outskirts of the capital of Mozambique, Maputo, we for the first time are financing these small enterprises that are providing services and we are doing it to help them to increase access and to increase quality of service. And that's an innovative approach to financing SMEs and the local private sector. Thank you. Excellent. So, Cheryl, I'm going to ask you the same question as well, and uh, yeah, please don't make me use the red card. <laughs> okay. Good. Go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, in 2019, um, the CEO water mandate and uh, McKinsey did a, set, a study to understand um, the global companies that were making up the biggest water footprint. Um, and what they found was that there was just 150 companies uh, globally in their supply chains um, that uh, were responsible for one-third um, of global water use. And this is the target for, um, for the Water Resilience Coalition. There's 250 companies who have signed the commitments of the CEO water mandate on, on corporate um, stewardship, um, but just 37 um, in, the, in the two years that uh, the industry has been active that have, um, that have signed up to um, the Water Resilience Coalition. Now I will add that at the UN Water Conference, another 50 companies joined the open call for business leadership on, on water, which um, includes many of the commitments um, of the Water Resilience Coalition. But to scale up, we could have so much impact if these uh, largest water users um, from the private sector were joining together to co-invest, uh, as I mentioned, to bring their expertise um, to water. So that would be our call for, for scale up, to have more companies uh, working together in a targeted way, uh, because decentralized um, uh, efforts are not giving us the impact that we need. We need joined up um, efforts. Uh, very much agreed. So if any companies out there are listening, uh, I'm sure we can uh, put you in touch with Cheryl. 
Uh, Abu, please, the same question to you. Okay, I, I have three points. Uh, the first one, I believe that if you, we want really innovation uh, to be uh, uh, contributing to solve our, our, our challenges, we need to make knowledge accessible. So open science should be the way forward. We shouldn't produce the knowledge and keep it somewhere for some limited number of people, no. We need to open the knowledge so that everybody can have access and it will feed the process of innovation. This, this, this for us is fundamental. And as you know, within UNESCO, we have members set 194 now. Uh, they approve the uh, UNESCO recommendation for open science. So that's the way, first way forward. The second one, we need to work directly with the beneficiaries uh, to understand their needs. This is critical because we ha have example of technology which sometimes because of the, f the way they were put in place were not accepted by beneficiaries. So bringing beneficiaries within that process is critical. The third is of course empowerment. We need to empower young people, women, girls, all across is extremely important. So those are the three points I believe that we should emphasize in moving forward and upscaling the issue of innovation. Thank you. That's excellent. Thanks so much to our four panelists. I'm going to innovate in terms of the session uh, program because I have a second question for the speakers, which I will not ask them because I want to take questions from the floor. Um, I just want to say that we are taking note of the many questions in the chat for the online participants, and we will respond to all of them. Um, if not during the session, then we will also put up an email address where you can write afterwards because we don't want this to just be a 90 minutes speak now or forever hold your peace, but uh, an ongoing dialogue. So I'm going to open it up now um, to questions from the floor. And I, I see Juan Pablo here. Are there any other hands raised? One at the back. I'm going to take these two, maybe three if there's a third hand. If not, just two. That will be enough. Juan Pablo. Let's see if this is working. <laughs> Uh, can we get in this? Uh, it's, I think it's for the recording that uh, we need to make sure it's being captured for posterity. Personally, one innovation I do is that during the week it's impossible to watch all the sessions, so I actually watch them afterwards. I'm a World War Week nerd. That's my fun fact. Um, I've just about finished the 2022 sessions uh, from the World War Week. You might say the fun fact about me being a nerd was not really a Hello. surprise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, just uh, reflecting on the enabling capabilities for developing uh, innovation. I think that uh, it's better to innovate when you have enabling conditions. And I was wondering if politics is one of those. And the question is not about politics, but about communication. Mm -hmm. Are we communicating well enough to get the political traction that we need to get the uh, conditions to, to make the innovation? The question is about communication, innovating yeah. in communication. Wow. Two for the price of one from Juan Pablo. Uh, would you mind, yes, passing up the back, please? Um, those, I'm going to take the second question and then I'll turn it over to the four panelists to see which of those two tough questions uh, they want to answer. Um, as well as this upcoming question. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Paul Deverell from uh, UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, and it, it's, it's just interesting because it's related a little bit to that last question. We don't rehearse this, but can you think of innovations to capture the political leadership needed to actually make any of this work? Thanks. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I will also take one question uh, from the chat. Uh, which I think is also relevant um, uh, and, and related, in fact. It's, uh, what's the best way to collaborate with the civil society, uh, business society, authorities, and academia to generate innovation? So, very simple questions from the audience. Thank you all. <laughs> and I will turn over to the four speakers. I'll give you 60 seconds each to answer as many of those questions as you can. 
So who wants to go first? Putting you on the I spot. Try, okay, try. Gustavo, please. I can um, try. I don't know. I don't know if I will respond to the questions, but I'll say something, anyways. So, so uh, Paul and Juan Pablo on the political leadership. I can share also uh, some experience from from the World Bank in terms of the adoption of some of the innovative approaches that we are proposing. For instance, there is one that we call the Utilities of the Future, which is promoting, you know, a vision, uh, a few. I would say a futuristic vision for utilities. I mean, it's not so futuristic uh, because it's about building resilience and inclusion, but also innovation. So we, I mean, we have moved away, the World Bank, from the traditional approach to supporting utilities only to improve efficiency. I mean, that they need to do for obvious reasons, but also to, uh, to be more resilient, to be part of the communities where they operate and to embrace innovation. And this, inno this initiative, again, that we call Utilities of the Future, we, we started two years ago and we are already implementing it in more than 100 utilities worldwide. And I, I would say when you articulate and when you uh, explain to the authorities, to the leaders, not only of the utilities, but the city mayors and others, you know, this vision of the future in general is embraced. So I, I would say this is a, an interesting example of an initiative that is innovative, but is uh, adopted and supported by political leaders. Thank you. Um, working with political leaders, often we need to give them a medal to hang around their necks, and selling a vision of what they can achieve out of this is, is very important. Uh, I think Abu then show off, please. Yeah. Yeah. Two questions which are um, Critical questions indeed, because if you really want uh, uh, in innovation to be developed uh, worldwide, uh, we need to have that enabler environment. And the enabler environment should be put in place, of course, by decision makers in different countries. And we believe that uh, having a framework is essential. The example I was uh, alluding to on the uh, open science framework is really a good example and now we have all the countries are uh, using that framework to develop national action plan on how they can move forward in making knowledge accessible. And in that framework, of course, all the issue of inno innovation is there also because it's science, technology, and innovation. Uh, so we believe that having framework, global framework, and then uh, member states can use those framework uh, to uh, adopt their policy at national level is something which is, for us, a, a way forward. The other element on the issue of, uh, of communication is also something on the, on, for which uh, having tailored messages, particularly for young people, I'm really emphasizing on young people, uh, and also at community level, bringing on board the beneficiaries is something I f we believe that also we can uh, uh, stress moving forward in upscaling the actions related to innovation. Thank you, Abu. Cheryl, please. Uh, so I think my comment is building on the comments of, of the others. So um, I would just comment on the enabling environment um, that I think we, we still struggle to bring together the conversations for decision making. So we have the political discussion, we have the business discussion, we have the investment discussion, and the investment discussion is split even further between the development banks and private investors. And um, I'm fascinated by an approach um, for carbon. Um, Richard Branson um, created an initiative called the Carbon War Room. I think we would all agree maybe war is the wrong word here, but I think the idea um, was to get experts that are relevant to that issue they want to solve all in a room to hash it out until they come to a, a joint solution. And that was successful um, in the U.S. around some of their carbon policy, and uh, perhaps we need that for water. Excellent. Innovative thinking. Um, Dave, anything you'd like to add on these uh, three tough questions the audience have asked us? Nothing of the caliber. This is what's gone before. It's really, really impressive. A couple of simple comments, though. I think, one, you're asking questions that are not just for the wash sector. You're asking questions which are for the world. And I think part of it is looking at what else is happening and how else is that happening. Engaging politicians, just speak to a lobby group. 
I'm, I'm not saying it's that simple, but it's, it's a matter of we need to be looking outside our scope. We need to be looking what is out there and looking at what can we adapt, adapt and adopt. Um, I think that is fairly fundamental. And I think for a lot of innovation, the wash sector can be conservative. And sometimes it's not a matter of having to go and invent the new wheel. It's a matter of actually seeing the Romans have invented the wheel and we'll just put some new treads on it and make it a little better and make it right for what we need. So. I'd like to ask you to give a round of applause, please, to our four panellists. <laughs> Who can now sit down and uh, enjoy the rest of the, the session. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. I have to say they've raised the bar really high uh, and putting the, the finger on some really interesting issues there. Uh, innovation is relative. Uh, combining existing elements with new adaptations, these are all really important elements of innovation. Now we are going to try a social experiment as well. Um, if I can get the presentation up, please. Um, I don't have the pin for this laptop. Um, so if one of the assistants please could uh, put that up while I change microphones to keep you on your toes. Um, we have a fictitious water-related scenario that we're going to present to you. Um, any resemblance to any city that you live in is, is complete coincidence. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, we will uh, ask three commitment holders from the Water Action Agenda, which you must have heard a lot about already. If you haven't, then you will this week. Um, to uh, share their experiences and how they would apply their solutions to this fictitious case. But uh, in order to explain the fictitious scenario, I'd like to invite Ahmed El Haj, um, the GWP innovation intern, to well tell you about it. So, Ahmed, please. Can you have the All right. So, hello everyone. Thank you for being here. Such an interesting session. So, talking about innovation, actually, I've used like AI to generate. This amazing design, see, a couple of minutes. Well, and I asked for a normal city. So if you can see where, where are we <laughs> located right now. So we call the city, me and Colin, we called it the Simville. As you can see here, we have some major water challenges. We could start by the major industrial companies here that uh, affected the water quality. And we have uh, pictures of polluted water, polluted rivers that also affected the, uh, the ecosystem. Also, these companies and these industrial base consumes a lot of water, but as most of the people think that industry consumes like the majority of the water sources of the city, actually it's not. It is farming. As you see, we have like, some farming lands here and agricultural lands that consumes up to 70% of the Simville city water resources. And the uh, water use efficiency in the city in agriculture is very low. The contribution of agriculture into the city economy is only 10%. And it's for uh, exportation and not for uh, local and personal use. Also, the use of like lands for industrial uh, company and for the agriculture uh, and for farming caused a huge loss of uh, biodiversity and a degradation of the ecosystems. And uh, unfortunately as well, uh, which caused uh, a loss of the services of the, the ecosystem as purifying the water and uh, stabi stabilizing the, uh, the water quality. Also, we can conclude here that we have reached something called the Simville because of the lack of trust and collaboration between uh, the stakeholders and the, and the other uh, sectors. Unfortunately, this is what we are living now. I believe every one of you has seen or has lived in a Simville. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed. And to, to solve Simville's problems, uh, we've got three real life um, commitment holders in the Water Action Agenda, who I will ask to come up to stage by introducing them through their fun facts. So first we have Alexi de Kerkov. Thank you for helping me to pronounce your name. Uh, who, um, from, who is the Senior Director of Client Sustainability for Europe and the UK regions uh, for, at Xylem. Xylem is a global solution supplier delivering expertise and technologies to solve water challenges. Um, and the fun fact about Alexi is that he's originally from Belgium but moved to Stockholm to join uh, Xylem in 2011. 
And despite the fact that he lives in the city, he manages to keep his favorite pets with him, and they are seven chickens that provide him and his family with their supply of fresh eggs, which is very welcome. Um, I will now invite the second um, innovative solution holder, which is Akanksha Jain, to join us. Um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, Kangshi is an environmental engineer currently working at ETH Zurich, and she is passionate about youth involvement in the water sector and promotes this under the umbrella of Swiss Water Partnership Youth. The fun fact about Akanksha is that she can read and write Arabic but has no comprehension of it. <laughs> Beat that. And uh, the third is Christine Colvin from WWF International. She is the head of policy for freshwater. Her fun fact is that she can say that railway station in Wales with the longest name, which I will ask her to pronounce, please, to see if it's true. I wish I hadn't said this fun fact. Clamve pokinge go gerochwindro po clandesilio go go go. Any Welsh speakers in the audience? <laughs> you can correct me. If there are any Welsh speakers in the room or online, <laughs> can you please tell us if she did a good job? Okay. Um, I am going to put our three speakers, our three commitment holders, on the spot by asking them in 90 seconds if the three of you were to apply your real-time solution um, to that you've committed to the Water Action Agenda to Simville, how would you go about it? So I'll start with Alexis. Alexi, please. Okay. Thank you very much for having, uh, having us over here. I think it's, it's great. Um, you know, a few points, and I just want to, don't sound like a broken record, but we have heard so many great expertise already so far. What we see here on the screen is a broken system. A broken system with no integrations among the, the stakeholders, lack of drivers, and so on. I just want to refer to what our peer from PUB mentions and the success that they, they've been driving. This city had no way to build an ecosystem for innovations. They have no political agenda around water. They have no long view for adaptations and climate mitigations. They have zero way of building a healthy cash flow around the water management systems with circularity, or even no way to have educations and build capacity in uh, promoting this. So I w maybe, I have no idea how was PUB 60 years ago, but maybe this is a picture of all PUB um, that was completely transformed by those five key points that, was, that were highlighted in the previous uh, session. So coming out of those key points, the one that I really would like to enhance uh, are a, a few. When we look at a long-term uh, innovation planning, we know, and talking about Global North as a kind of example toward the world of how management can be done, we see that the system is very conservative and always prioritizing what we call gray old-fashioned infrastructure. The OECD two years ago made a very nice report showing that in Europe, there, we're lacking about 30% of funding just to sustain our targets of access to water and sanitation across Europe. This was made without looking at blue or green infrastructures. That means digital or uh, nature-based solutions. So really prioritizing what innovations is all about uh, is very important. The second key point I'd like to highlight is the conservatism in the procurement system all across Europe. We had a glimpse about this earlier in the, system, in the discussion, but our procurement system is based on looking at the most definable, viable solutions to meet a target and not look at the potential gain that innovations could bring on the table. So I'd like to stop here because I think there will be more um, op opportunity to speak and give the word to you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Alexi. And uh, Kangsha, what would you add to that? Uh, there some some easy fixes, but are there any any that come to your mind? Yeah, it's quite the doomsday picture, isn't it? I see some very specific technical solutions. Firstly, my first suggestion would be to introduce some circularity into the system. So decentralized treatment with water reuse is one example that would tackle not just the water quality issues, but also the water scarcity. And uh, that's... I think it's a very clever way to bring back lost resources back in the system, whether be it water, energy, or nutrients. My second recommendation would be perhaps blue-green infrastructure. So that can also, it would be an active approach to fix the ecosystem losses that Ahmed mentioned. So fixing the infiltration problem. And this has cascading benefits for not just surface water regulation, but also water quality and other 
things beyond the water, so even heat island mitigation or so. And an end of the pipe solution could be from the governance side that you have stringent regulations in place and a body that ensures that they are being followed. But I do believe that the bottom line is that we need trained professionals to implement these solutions, to bring them to action. And our commitment, the 30-30-30 commitment towards the water action agenda strives for this. What we're asking for is youth under the age of 30 to be involved or to be represented at least by 30% in the decision-making team until 2030. So that's the three 30s. And my idea is that once youth is in that position, they should do justice to it. And the way they can do justice to that is by making sure that we train them to be competent. And that's where capacity building comes in. That's excellent. Thanks you much, so much for that, Kangsha. That, that All of this deserves a round of applause. Christine, so uh, how would our panda friends build upon these uh, solutions? Yeah, well, our um, contribution to the Water Action Agenda is very much obviously focused on nature. Um, and that's something that looks particularly dystopian about this picture, is the complete absence of anything living, healthy and thriving. And um, at the UN Water Conference, um, we worked with countries to put forward something called the Fresh Water Challenge. And we've got our own 30s for that as well, um, which is that 30% of degraded rivers and wetlands will be committed to restoration by 2030. And we want to, again, working with a whole range of partners, want to support countries to be able to achieve this commitment, which countries have already committed to under the new global biodiversity framework. Um, so that's something that we're talking about in, in several sessions during the course of this week. It's very much at the interface of um, wildlife and biodiversity management um, water management, but also climate adaptation, because something that's really absent in this picture is any sense of resilience or coping capacity. And by looking at nature restoration, particularly through nature-based solutions in the water sector, um, we can solve many problems at one time um, and have a, a thriving mechanism to cope with the water shocks that we know are coming thick and fast. Um, I've yet to see the results of Hurricane Hillary um, hitting the states after Mexico, um, but this is just a daily occurrence for all of us. Nature is our biggest ally in combating the climate crisis, and so we need to bring it back into this picture really fast. Amazing. Thanks so much to the three of you. I'd like to invite now, completely unscripted and uh, off the cuff, any of you to build upon any of the points that your other panelists made, anything you'd like to add, or what, what's missing still? Would those three sets of actions be enough to put Simville back on the right pathway? And, and what, what secret source would actually gel all of that together? Any of you? Uh, I think what you said about the gel, all of that together, I think that's important. And what we are missing maybe is collaboration mm -hmm. between these different things. I really liked what was said earlier about the carbon war room. Maybe water war room is the solution to that. Yeah. And also I see a direct synergy with the nature-based solutions mm -hmm. and blue-green infrastructure. So this could be the technical mm -hmm. input that we could collaborate on. And I, I think part of the, the source is also um, the glue of good governance. And, um, and that's where our three areas can come together very effectively. Um, we've seen that in a lot of countries where uh, new technologies have helped to democratize the data and share really what's going on, both in the health of our ecosystems and in the state of pollution. Um, and I think another critical issue is that many of the jobs that are needed to fix up this picture don't exist yet. Um, there was the great point earlier about AI and you know whether any of us uh, were using this a year ago and how many will be using it in the future. Um, 
our jobs and the career landscape within the water sector are going to change very, very dramatically. So it's really important that we have an adaptable, flexible, um, next cohort of professionals in this sector who are really um, digitally savvy, but who also understand how to bring the best of our green and grey infrastructure together and to work both with science and engineering, work with natural systems and engineered systems, because we can't treat them in isolation anymore. And we also can't build engineered systems on the assumption that the natural systems will keep delivering water into them. We've passed that tipping point. Um, so the link with data, new, new um, careers and nature, for me, is very clear. So imagining Simville in 60 years, uh, like Singapore now. Um, Alexis, what, Alexis, what else would be needed other than that? I, what, what worries me about this picture is the obvious lack of water strategy. Um, implemented by a higher governance. I mean, you talk about governance. Um, what worries me even more about that is that globally, we lack regional, Europe, I mean, European, North American global water strategies that truly um, elaborate how over the next 50 years water will be funded globally or by regions. Hydrogen has a strategy uh, planning across Europe energy, electro, microchips, all those massive sectors over the last uh, five, 10 years, in, I mean, benefited from a very strong strategy across governments to fund them over programs with billions. When was the last time did we have a comprehensive water strategy for Europe? Never, for example. And we started talking about it at the UN Water Conference now I think that we are on a good track, and in Europe at least, to move that direction. But it is really worrying not to see that across. Um, and that I think will probably uh, 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 go towards the governments, go towards youth engagements and innovations. Excellent, so now I, I think Simville would be in much better shape uh, if it were to implement all of that, but I'm, I'm gonna turn to our first four panelists to give them 60 seconds each to reflect on what else would be missing. And I will um, pass the mic to you. <laughs> 60 seconds, starting now. <laughs> um, I think Mark, yeah. Sorry, I think actually much of what was discussed discussed addresses many of the issues i think time is really the thing that's missing i think yeah you talk about 60 years some of the chemicals it's likely to be going out of there 60 years isn't going to do it so that that would be my initial thought purely time Gustavo. no i think all you know what i was thinking or could think of has been said i would uh, highlight though the circular economy approach that brings together the agriculture sector. Alexei, I think you mentioned, you know, the overuse or the, you know, excess use, you didn't put it in those terms of water by agriculture, uh, but circular economy is an opportunity to bring together water management at the city level and agriculture and irrigation, etc. So I would emphasize that more uh, because it's an opportunity to reduce pollution, but to use better the scarce water resource. Thank you. Cheryl, any other innovative solutions that we haven't come up with? Uh, there is a risk, by the way, that you can reach a, a, a plateau of like uh, same thing, you know, where all everything's been said, so I, I just agree, but be disruptive, Cheryl. Okay, well, when I look at this picture, it makes me think of the economic models that have driven this degradation and what incentives had to be in place for this to happen. And therefore, a solution or something to think about, you know, could be, you know, a, a, a rethinking uh, of the economic models, a, a rethinking of the value of water as, um, as the, the great initiative, the Valuing Water Initiative has been doing, um, to start to implement different incentives and different economic models that drive um, the value that we know the resource has. Excellent. Abu, anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of things have been said or almost, but uh, I want um, to stress the fact that, you know, uh, everything is uh, behind people. 
and change should come from people. So from my perspective, I think empowerment for transformation is key. Uh, of course, throughout all of what was said, that element of uh, changing the mindset of all the key stakeholders, having a uh, common understanding on the critical need to s ensure the integrity of the system, otherwise every f everybody will lose. So that change of mindset is critical. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, Dave would just like to, <laughs> to, to add one final thing. Since oh. I have the mic. Yes. By the, by the way, where are the people in that picture? Yeah. Exactly. Maybe they are all dead, uh, but. Yeah. Maybe it's a ghost town. <laughs> Sorry, I, I think I'm hearing AI mentioned a lot in terms of replacing jobs and everything else. I think one thing that we haven't heard mentioned today is basically doing the basics better now. And I think that can make a vast difference. And I actually think AI may have a role just in that. Yes, it may replace my job in far sooner peri time periods than I want to think about. But maybe much sooner, it can help me do my job much, much better. And I think that's an area we might want to think about. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for that, Dave. And thanks so much to our, our three stars here and the four stars down there. <laughs> yeah. um, so now we get to the part of wrapping up uh, the last uh, 83 minutes of uh, wisdom that has been poured into our brains by uh, these panelists. Um, I would just like to say a few things. One is that uh, there are 830-something um, examples in the Water Action Agenda of commitments from different stakeholders, which on their own would probably not solve m m all of the problems we face around water. And, and I think the combining of those commitments, uh, the combining of talents which go beyond our comfort zones it's really important. It's very easy for me to say, okay, this is what GWP is going to, it's actually not always easy to say this is what GWP is gonna do because I have management structures above me as well. But it's easier to do that than to say, I'm gonna come up with a model that involves WWF and the CEO water mandate and UNICEF on a joint collaboration where we all agree that what we can do together is more, more impactful than what we can do individually. Um, so this is the open invitation that I would like to share with all of you. Um, innovation is not a magic bullet. It's not that uh, you have a very specific thing to do, and if you do that, then um, everyone will, everything will be fine. Innovation is a change in mindset that all of us need to adopt. Doing things differently and doing different things. Um, so I'm not going to tell each of you what are those different things, uh, but each of you can, I invite you to think about what it is that you do in your daily job. What could be more impactful? It is what you're doing business as usual? Innovation should be the antidote to business as usual. Um, if we are ready to take those risks, are we ready to take those risks? That's the open question that I have for all of you. Um, so we have five minutes left and this session uh, has been co-convened by GWP and UN Water and with that I would like to invite Mary Matthews from UNDP but also representing UN Water uh, to give her final remarks but I would like to introduce Mary um, of course appropriately she is the senior technical advisor for water uh, at interim and UNDP ocean advisor and ocean innovation challenge manager wearing three hats Mary actually gave me four fun facts about her, and I'm still debating which of them is the best. Um, but I'm, I'm going to give one that I thought was good, and it's the shortest, which is that she's currently studying Krav Maga. So that is pretty cool. Um, so Mary, please, to close the session, uh, you have five minutes, please. Over to you. All right. Um, I'm going to pick up on the Krav Maga for a second, because this, like, I just heard someone go, what's that? It's a form of martial arts that doesn't have any rules. I love it, okay, because I can get to do anything. I mean, beat up 25-year-olds, it's a great thing to get to do. Um, <clears throat> anyway, okay, but it's an innovation. I mean, it really is. You get to be really innovative really quick, and so do they, and it's a lot of fun. Um, that having been said, as we've been talking today, one of the things of all the hats I've been wearing, for the past three years, I've been running an innovation challenge 
uh, for UNDP. And I have to tell you, I absolutely love working with innovators because they are so optimistic. They're the ones who when everything in the news is saying, yeah, everything's gonna be really bad and it's getting worse and there's nothing we can do. They're the ones who say, oh, wait, I know how to fix this. I have a solution. I wanna try the solution. So we'll talk about that more in a minute, but as I was sitting here in this session where Joaquin kind of set everything up, I was like, oh, here we go again. And in a good way, because we need to be reminded, even though we're the ones who need to be spreading that message out, because we are literally speaking to the converted here. And then when we heard about Singapore, everything there, I was like, yes, yes, that worked, and yes, that worked. And it's great, because you've actually been able to do what so many of us need, no, we've got to get, we've got to get this done. We need to take the model of Singapore as a model that we can then work from and we can learn from in so many different ways. And the fact that you're sharing everything is really, really critical. And then we got to hear from our different colleagues who are also doing really neat innovations in terms of figuring out how to make changes, whether they're small changes or big changes, and really with innovation, they can be any size change. They're making these changes over and over and over, and it's really exciting to see these. I mean, honestly, Dan, you're right. UN is not set up to work with banks. We don't know how to do that. We're afraid of it, like, oh my heavens. And, and um, Gustavo, programming for results, thank you. Thank you, that needed to happen. Why haven't we been doing that for a long time? And, and um, Cheryl, uh, we have to talk more, um, but getting the private sector involved. I mean, the private sector is all about coming up with innovations. I mean, that's kind of what the whole private sector is. Um, Abu, thank you for reminding us that we have to talk to the people who we're helping, because if we don't talk to them, it does not work. It doesn't matter how brilliant the idea is, if, it, if we don't capture what they need, nobody's gonna use it. And it can honestly end up creating a lot of problems, and we don't want that. Um, so that's been a really, um, really important lesson. And I've been before doing all this <clears throat> innovation stuff, I was doing stakeholder stuff. And I found if you don't ask the innovators, or you don't ask the people, wow, you miss a lot. We don't have all the answers, and that's one of the big things here, is we're all sit standing here going, we need to get people to pay attention to this. Of course we do, but how do we do that? We don't have those answers, but we're working on it, we've gotta work on it together, and we've gotta figure that out. And some of the ideas about the infrastructure for the future. I mean, what a great idea, why can't we do that? Let's like all go back to organizations and say, okay, I've just come from this conference and if we do water right, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna be gorgeous, it's gonna be beautiful. Our grandchildren will not hate us. On, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm worried about too. Um, on the other hand, if we go back and go, yeah, if we don't get this right, our grandchildren not only will not hate us, they may not survive. And that's a really sad, horrible thing to have to think about. That's the message we need to be be spreading because we can't get water right, we can't get the rest of it right, people. Okay, um, what do we need for innovation? We need enabling environments. Singapore, you guys had it, thank you. We need to transplant that all over the world, but how do we do that? We've gotta have the finance side of it, and we've gotta have new and innovative finances in all sorts of ways of doing that. We've gotta get the capacity. We've gotta learn how to communicate people. We do not do that well. We've got to learn how to communicate this stuff because we've all got the information, but if the rest of the world can't scream about this with us, it's gonna be really hard to make a change. We've gotta to talk to our stakeholders. We've gotta get more and more people involved. We've got to support our innovators. We've gotta come up with challenges and funding and support and mentoring and guidance. And, you know, I mean, within the Innovation Challenge I run, we have innovators who are brilliant and they come up with these really, really incredibly good transformational ideas, but they don't know that a subject line in an email is how people search their email. They need some mentoring, they need some help. That's it, we can do that. We are all capable and we're capable of helping each other. Um, one more thing we have to do, we've got to learn, we've got to continually, continually change and learn. As a species, we have done that 
We are the masters of learning. We need to keep doing that and we need to do it a whole lot faster. We need to learn from Mother Nature. She's figured it out. Ask any engineer. Mother Nature is like the most incredible engineer there is. We need to learn from her. We have very little time on this. We may have gone too far. We have probably overshot and gone way beyond it. But for the sake of our kids and our grandkids and maybe our great grandkids, we, we owe it to, to figure this out. And somebody's got some great tunes there. Okay, um, we've got to value water and we've got to value our futures. And we can't do that if we can't figure out how to do the innovation and to work together and to collaborate and to take into account what all of us know we need to do, which is get out there and do it. Oh. Thank you very much. Very inspiring uh, final words. We, the session has now concluded. I think at some point we're gonna get kicked out of here. I'm going to stay around uh, for a, a while if anyone has any questions, and I'm sure you have. If you don't have any questions, you probably weren't paying attention for the last 90 minutes. There's also uh, an email address, which is unwater at un.org, where if you do have any questions specifically on this topic, uh, you can send it, and we will make sure that it's replied to uh, appropriately. And uh, yeah, please go out that door and be innovative and make this world a better place. Thank Colin, you. Colin, let me jump in with one more thing. We're r I'm running a talk show on Tuesday at four o'clock on how to foster innovation. Would love for you all to be there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.